So good evening, everyone. Today is uh, we have a very important topic by Dr. Nitin Jagasya, emergency management of polytrauma. And last DNB theory exam, there was a question also, and always some or other question is asked about polytrauma emergency management. So without any delay, I would like to invite Dr. Nitin Jagasya, and we are thankful for his participation. And on future also, we would like to invite him for such lectures. Dr. Jagasya, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me for this session. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, for about 40 minutes on emergency management of polytrauma. Uh, I aim to cover the following objectives. First uh, and foremost would be the priorities, how we would deal with the polytrauma patient. Uh, then I'll have a couple of minutes each on the trauma team. Uh, how do we manage shock? Uh, concept known as damage control orthopedics and couple of discussion points I hope that you guys can ask some questions on. So polytrauma what by definition because you've got a lot of students and you'd be asked to define so polytrauma has got uh, multiple definitions but the commonest two that are used one is known as uh, two or more injuries to physical region, regions uh, or organ systems one of which is life-threatening. And uh, second would be a syndrome of multiple injuries. So uh, I'll explain it better on the next slide. It's known as the injury severity score. So the graph on the right actually matches your injury severity score against the mortality on the y-axis. So needless to say, the higher the injury severity score, the higher chance of mortality. So on the left, the blue table, uh, there are nine regions in the body physically, head, face, neck, and so on. And each region you divide into six grades known as abbreviative injuries scale. So, for example, if you take the head and you've got a laceration, that would probably be minor. If you've got a deep laceration, it becomes moderate. If, you've, if it goes into the bone, it is serious, and so on. So you would score each region, give it a particular number, and then you would square that. And the three most injured region, you add that up, which gives you the total injury severity score. And that would help you uh, prognosticate. So when you actually uh, are treating a patient and you can identify that they have two organs or three organs injured and you score them, it will tell you that, okay, they've got an injury severity score. Uh, and going back to the slide, if it's more than 15, 1, 5, it is known as a polytrauma. If at any time uh, you have an unsurvivable or you score 6 in a particular physical region, the ISS automatically becomes 75, which is the highest score and uh, would be a high mortality rate. So that would be about how you define a polytrauma and how you would actually score it uh, to help you understand or help you guide the uh, patient and the relatives about what you're expecting the outcome as. Uh, to kick things off, uh, as usual, taking a clinical scenario, you've got a female, 38 year old, involved in a road traffic accident. You've got some vitals there, a respiratory rate which is up, pulse which is tachycardic 145. Uh, they're talking, but they're confused. So you've got a low sort of 13 GCS. Um, and you've got some injuries there. So slightly difficult on the webinar, but normally to make it interactive, the first question would be, do you need uh, to identify specific injuries before you manage this patient? If not, how would you go ahead? So just to give you some um, sort of a structure. There are some concepts in trauma management, which I'm sure all of you are already aware of. And I'll be just describing them in some detail. First thing would be preparation. So if you've actually got some time before the patient arrives, you've got some pre-arrival information, you'd get your trauma bay ready. You'll get all your important splits, uh, splints, medications. You'll, you may even activate the trauma team. And the patient's in front of you, you start with what we call the primary survey. And it's got some adjuncts, detailed secondary survey once they stabilize, 
and then definitive care and reevaluation. So I'll be going through that uh, in the next few slides. What this actually has come from is what is known as the ATLS, which was founded in 1977, which says treat the greatest threat to life first. And luckily for us, it's a simple ABCD approach. A, airway, because it's trauma, airway always, always goes with C, spine protection. So having the C collar on, having blocks and tape on, so it's also known as the holy trinity. So you'll have airway with C, spine protection, B for breathing, so breathing along with ventilation, and you always give them oxygen, which is the maximum 100%, or in other words, 15 liters through a non-rebreather mask. C, circulation, that always goes with hemorrhage control. So if somebody is losing blood and you, you're trying to support their circulation with fluids or giving them blood transfusion, you still have to get hemorrhage control because whatever you're giving in, otherwise will just be coming out. D is for disability, which is a neurological status or GCS as we know, along with pupils. Um, and don't forget glucose, it always goes with disability. E, exposure with environmental control. So why is it in this order, A, B, C, D, E? It's because treat the greatest threat to life first. Airway, if it is compromised, is going to kill you quicker than if your breathing is compromised. And circulation will be third in line. So that is why you have this approach and you would assess airway and do the interventions. If you're happy with the airway, you move on to breathing. Breathing, if you find some things, you would intervene and correct those. Then you go to circulation. At any time, if the patient deteriorates or you finish a particular intervention, you go back and do an A, B, C, D, E, which is the re-evaluation. So let's look at airway. First step would be assessing the airway. Again, because we can't do it on the webinar, the, how would you assess someone's airway? You just talk to them. You just ask them their name, you ask them what happened or where they are. If they talk back to you, it tells you that the airway is patent, which means the oxygen or the air that they're breathing can actually make it down into the trachea and get into their lungs. So their airway is fine. If the airway is not patent, if they don't talk to you, then you have to further assess it. You know, whether there is any foreign body, you know, we, we do see geriatrics as well. The dentures would have fallen back. Uh, because of trauma, there could be blood. Because they are not fully conscious, vomitus could be present. If they're just obtunded, if the GCS is less than eight, they, their tongue could have fallen back. And that is why their airway is not patent. Uh, burns, swelling, or any other trauma. These could all compromise your airway. So if you find any of these when you're assessing the airway, absolutely key to correct that first. It wouldn't be that you move on to B, C, or you, you see the leg hanging off and you're trying to look after the leg. But actually, you need to look up the airway before you sort the leg out because that is the most life-threatening problem at this moment. So how would we do that? We would make an assessment of the airway um, and there's a mnemonic called lemon, which helps you guide whether if you decided to intervene in the form of an intubation. So if you had to do an endotracheal intubation, is this going to be a straightforward grade one or an easy intubation, or is this going to be a very difficult intubation? You go through lemon. There are some facial features that may trigger you thinking that it's going to be difficult. For example, they have a beard or they have a low chin, you know, obviously if there's facial trauma, that means the anatomy is going to be distorted. Uh, you also have a physical rule that you can measure the incisor distance. If they can open their mouth for you, obviously there'll be a collar on, which will uh, cause a problem. Malampati is in there, but with somebody like supine, it won't be the most easiest. Neck mobility, if you've got somebody with a collar, obviously that is reduced. Then you'd have your plan so you know you've got an airway compromised over here it can be all the way from a straightforward intubation all the way down to a surgical cricothyrotomy somewhere in between you would just need to support the airway uh, we could support the airway in the form of a oropharyngeal known as Giddel airway or the nasopharyngeal and that would be enough to make the airway patent so once you've done that intervention 
the airway is now patent and you give the oxygen and it's going to get into the lungs. So that would be about airway. I'm not going to any more detail uh, given the, the team we have on board today. Moving on to breathing, you, you look for your signs. So the best way to assess someone's breathing is by standing at the foot end. So that the picture on the left uh, shows you if it projects well enough that the left side of the chest is asymmetrically higher than the right side. Once you see that, you can identify that this chest is not moving equally. And then depending on your inspection or palpation, you'll be looking for further bruising on the chest or how that chest is moving. The extra actually shows you a large pneumothorax, which you would actually call tension because the mid midline or the mediastinum has been pushed towards the right-hand side. You would get other signs on examination, like surgical emphysema seen on the x-ray better than on the picture. Your main identifying, you're mainly looking for when you're assessing breathing are these major life-threatening problems like tension pneumothorax, massive pneumothorax, a flail chest, which means a part of the lungs will be moving paradoxically, means a part of the chest wall will be moving opposite. So when they are breathing in, your chest should come out, but there'll be a part of the chest going in. Or an open pneumothorax, which is like a sucking wound. So you see a flap, which sort of opens and closes with breathing. These are your major chest injuries, which you need to again intervene. If it's a tension, like the x-ray the, on the previous slide, you'd have to do a needle decompression. Uh, needle decompression is by any large bore IV cannula, 14 gauge, 16 gauge. Uh, the recent ATLS has updated it. Uh, originally, it was in the second intercostal space, but now it is done at the same place where would you you'd put an ICD or an intercostal drain. Um, so you do a needle decompression, you get a hiss, and you would have relieved the tension. But immediately following that, you need to put a chest drain in. Uh, for pneumothorax and hemothorax, treatment is a chest drain. For a sucking chest wound or an open pneumothorax, you'll put an occlusive dressing and you'll tape it down on three sides. Uh, what that does is it reverses the valve function that has happened because of the wound. So that every time they breathe in, it the, the dressing closes the wound and no air gets into the pleural space. When they breathe out, the dressing allows the air to come out of the pleural space. The chest drain typically is put in the fifth intercostal space um, and you would put it above the ribs because you've got the neurovascular bundle running just below the ribs and you put it in the triangle of safety. 90 to 95 percent of chest trauma, even though life-threatening, can be treated by a chest drain. There's only 5 to 10 percent that would need to be taken to the operation theater. So this is a really effective uh, treatment intervention. Um, the indication to take them to theater would be if they, once you put the chest drain in, you've got about 1800 to 2 liters come out immediately, or it is draining 200 ml per hour. Those would be your indication to take them for an open or a surgical intervention. But most of the cases, like I said, the chest drain would be enough. It would drain the pneumothorax. It would drain the hemothorax. The lung would expand, causing tamponade, and your breathing would be a lot better. Moving on to circulation. So what would happen to circulation in trauma? Shock. What do we mean by shock? It is a lack of blood supply or a blood flow that would cause a reduced end organ perfusion. What are the types of shock? Broadly talking about shock, there are four types. The most common one and the one we'll be focusing on today would be hypovolemic. Uh, then there's cardiogenic where there's a myocardial injury or a chronic uh, heart issue where the heart cannot pump properly. Obstructive shock, which is mainly trauma again because of a tension pneumothorax or a tamponade. And finally, a distributive shock, which is a medical shock, if you like, the anaphylaxis or the sepsis uh, where, where you've got pooling of the blood. Coming back to trauma, what are the causes in trauma for shock? Which of these? First would be hypovolemia. Second, 
hypovolemia and third hypovolemia so obviously you have to believe in trauma the cause of shock is hypovolemia you're not looking for the other causes you're not trying to treat the other causes you might have somebody who's fallen and you think this could be a spinal shock or a distributive shock but you still treat them as hypovolemia you might think it is obstructive because of chest injury you still treat the hypovolemia if you've given your fluid resuscitation and they don't respond then you'd be looking for these other causes now like i said trauma circulatory collapse shock causes hypovolemia so where is this blood luckily for us there's only five places and there's a mnemonic one on the floor four more one on the floor four more one on the floor straight forward what do i mean it's on the floor so it's an external injury it could be a limb that is uh, blown off it could be some deep uh, wound which is involving some blood vessel some big arterial vessel that is blood on the floor then you've got four more which are your four cavities as we call it some people also call it a cavity triage so you look at the four cavities and identify where this blood has gone first one chest abdomen pelvis and long bone so one on the floor and four more once you've got a circulatory collapse patient with trauma in front of you you've got these five areas and five areas alone one area that we may think of other than this would be the cranial cavity or a head injury but that is not big enough in adults to accommodate a large amount of blood to give you shock so these are your five areas how are you going to treat them how are you going to assess them so as you can see on your screen right now these are all things that you can pick up bedside you get an x ray chest and pelvis when you've got the trauma patient you've got an ultrasound machine and most emergency departments now where you do a e fast and you'll pick up free fluid in the tummy and for the fractured femur i don't think any of you need an x ray there are enough clinical signs the leg will be swollen the leg will be shortened the leg will be externally rotated so please do not get an x ray of that leg you know that is gone you know that is broken and you know the patient is in shock because you're going to lose 1.5 to 2 liters in your femur your pelvis you can lose anywhere up to 2.5 to 3 liters abdomen same again chest maybe 1 to 2 liters so this is your one on floor and four more bed side you're looking when you're on circulation you've got a hypotensive patient tachycardic patient you look at these five areas and what do you do you stop the bleeding how are you going to stop this bleeding you're going to transfuse them certainly you're going to start fluid or if you've got blood o negative blood you start that but you're going to stop this bleeding either by direct pressure if it's on the floor which means you've got an external area you can put direct compression on there you can put a tourniquet if it's on a, you know an amputated limb um, i was talking before we started about surgery cell or some sort of hemostatic agents that can be inserted into a a groin wound or an axillary wound which you can't actually uh, put a bandage around a uh, pelvis 2.5 to 3 liters how do you do it by reducing the pelvic volume i've got the slide next similarly any fracture and i'm talking about long bone fracture not not the not the radius ulna not not finger fractures and stuff and obviously operation if you got something inside your tummy and you've got free fluid there's nothing in er that you can do to stop that bleeding this patient is travel laparotomy if they are in that in between where you have a small proportion of patients they may be for angioembolization so coming back to pelvic volume pelvis is a huge uh, area where once you've got a fracture and the ring is disrupted you can lose a lot of blood most of this 85% of the times is to venous plexus so by closing this volume by closing your pelvis you would be causing a, a tamponade effect which sometimes or most of the times is enough to cause tamponade on the pelvic vessels and you will get some control on that bleeding the picture here you've got three different 
pelvic binders. This is even if you don't have a binder, just putting a, a bed sheet, just tying a bed sheet and getting the pelvis closed. Or you've got this type of binder, which has got three straps or a single strap. What is critical is the position of these binders. What you need to be at is the greater trochanter. This is your greater trochanter. Again, you don't need an X-ray. You can feel it laterally on the thigh. When you feel the bony prominence, that is your um, greater trochanter. If you go too high, like this picture, it will not close the pelvis. So volume will not close. So extreme left, that is the right position. If you put it low, it's okay. If you can't get it above for whatever reason, even this, this would do something. Even just getting the knees together and, buying, uh, and tying the knees together will actually help close the pelvis. Uh, we can't show it on this webinar, but if you actually see it physically, you've got Charlie Chaplin, so both your legs are pointing out. Just closing your legs like that will actually internally close your pelvis and reduce that volume, which will help with one of your cavities in circulation. Next is your femur fracture. Like I said, you don't need an x-ray in this scenario. You're in primary survey. You've done airway, you're happy. You've done breathing, you're happy. Your patient is collapsed, they're hypovolemic. You identified the long bone. Your femur on one side is swollen. Just pull it. You just straighten that leg, give it traction. What you're doing is you're reducing the volume within the thigh muscle. You're also bringing the two ends of the femur together, which may help stop the bleeding. Once you've got that on, you get skin traction on it. If you do not have the luxury of having orthopedic surgeons within your trauma team, just having anyone who's not even medically trained, just pull on the leg and hold it. Because just giving that traction, will you will see the patient will stabilize while you're transfusing them with fluids or blood. Um, I like always to ask this question, how do you know how much to pull? So God is very kind to us. You only pull till you meet the other leg. So when you pull the leg and the medial malleolus on the injured leg is at the same length as the non-injured leg, you've got traction. You've got where you need to be. The critical bit of it is don't release that traction. You, if you've got the skin traction kit and you've completed that, that's fine. But otherwise, you've lost one person of your team. They're just going to be holding that leg. You don't want to release that traction. So that will be about circulation. Moving on to disability. Disability basically means a neuro or a spinal injury. Neuro injury is bleeding inside the brain. Like I said earlier, this is a fixed box. You cannot get you know, enough blood in there to cause hypovolemic shock. So if you do not have hypovolemic shock, you've got somebody optunded, you don't have a normal GCS, so you've got some focal neurological signs, they're not moving one side of the body or they've had a seizure or they have a base of skull injury where they've got blood or CSF coming out of the ears or nose, you've got a D problem. Or you've got a spine problem like that X-ray over there where they're not moving uh, maybe both legs and you, you know, you've got a D problem. What do we do for D? When we assess them, we of course measure the GCS or you've got a smaller scale called AFPU. A, V, P, U. A is alert. Hopefully all of you are alert at the moment. Um, I am a bit monotonous. V will be verbal. So when you talk to them, they open their eyes. That's verbal. P as in pain. So you give them pain, they open their eyes, which equates to a GCS of 8. And U as in unconscious. And they're not responding even to pain. So that is a mini GCS. And then you have a formal GCS of 15 out of 15. What are your interventions? In your primary survey, if you're suspecting a spine injury, all you're doing is immobilization. You're not going to be fixing it. You're not going to be tractioning it. You're not going to be doing anything. You just have to immobilize it to make sure there's no further damage to the spinal cord. The primary injury has already happened where the accident is. There's no further injury. So spinal immobilization. With respect to the head, it's intubation. If you've got somebody with a head injury, you want to get their airway controlled because they're obtunded. You don't want them to aspirate. And plus, you want to prevent all these secondary brain injuries, which are, you don't want them to get hypotensive. You want a map of 90. 
you don't want them to get hypoxic brain needs a lot of oxygen so if they are hypoxic a brain that is injured and you insult them with hypoxia that brain is not going to recover very well uh, similarly the hypo and a hypercarbia hypocarbia means your co2 is low causes vasoconstriction so it will have a problem with the cerebral blood flow similarly hypercarbia will cause vasodilatation and again a problem with circulation so these are your secondary brain injuries that you need to avoid spinal cord injury if you are suspecting and they are within 8 hours of injury you can give them the dose of steroid if you've got if you can identify raised intracranial pressure in the form of a blown pupil um blood pressure 200 220 systolic uh, you have some temporary measures manitol uh, 20% 100 ml usually um, and sometimes repeated by another 100 ml and hyperventilation so though i said you prevent hypocarbia this is a temporizing measure where by hyperventilating them bringing the co2 down you will help with the circulation but both of these interventions are only getting them ready for surgery you are planning to take them into theater if you are transferring this patient out to another center then hyperventilation is not an option manitol may be but not hyperventilation because the side effects would be worse than the benefits moving on to exposure so a b c d we want to exposure uh, exposure on the left very easy you can see everything the picture on the right there are stab wounds on the back so exposure means having a look everywhere which is includes the back how do we do it we do it with what we call a log roll so your log roll is at the end of your primary survey where you turn the entire patient as a log as a log of wood so you've got one person at the head end uh who's in charge they are looking after the head with the c spine and you've got two or three people who are taking care of the body and then on the count of the person in charge of the head they will roll it roll the patient onto the patient's right hand side or patient's left hand side whichever one you choose and then the fourth member of the team the doctor would examine the back you're looking for any steps along the spinal uh you know the spinous processes you palpate if there's any steps any tenderness if they are awake to answer you will palpate around the paraspinal areas you will palpate the sacroiliac joints um and then you'll complete by a pr a digital rectal examination where you're looking for a couple of things one is in a male you're looking for a high riding prostate which would suggest a, a urethral injury or a pelvic injury or you would look for blood on your finger which may suggest that there's a pelvic fracture which is now perforated the rectum and you've got blood over there so that could make it an open pelvic fracture so that is how you would complete the log roll it's very important to roll them together and roll them back together you don't want to make any spinal injury potentially worse so that would be your primary survey you started with a then b c d e at any time you made any intervention you would go back at a and reassess if you're happy you move on to c move on to d once you finish a b c d e you will go back to a and reassess once you've completed your primary survey you would have your adjuncts which are your resuscitative resuscitative adjuncts e fast you've already spoken about you might get a blood gas um your vitals which includes your oxygen levels your heart rate get an ecg at this stage you get your x rays uh urine output if you've catheterized if there's no urethral injury and you may put a a rice tube in secondary survey so when do we go to secondary survey we we go to secondary survey when you've completed your primary survey and your patient is stable if if you found any injuries on them like the pelvis or intra abdominal they need to be going to theater then your secondary survey will happen is after their surgical intervention and they've stabilized but if they're stable in front of you or after putting a chest drain or after intubating them they become hemodynamically stable you do the secondary survey so what is it first step is an ample history so if you realized or not we haven't taken a history yet this is not like a standard patient who comes in and we take a history then we ask about the medicines their previous surgeries and try and identify differential diagnosis 
we've not done that we've jumped jumped on them we've done an a b c d e assessment and we started treating them we don't know if they're on warfarin we've just put the chest drain in right that is what you're doing now that you've stabilized them you get an ample history right do you have any allergies what medications are you on past medical history last meal and events further to that you go on to a full physical examination from head to toe you're going to examine starting from the scalp the entire face eyes nose ears neck all of it down to the toe and you would do a pr examination if it wasn't done earlier a pv examination in females and so on you'd be reassessing the vitals because these patients can deteriorate at any time you're constantly monitoring them but you're reassessing them is the bp started to drop off if the heart rate has started to go up i'll be talking about these vitals when i discuss shock in a few minutes and here is when you get your diagnostic studies so whatever else you would want to do which are known as reevaluation adjuncts so you might need a 2d echo you might need some other sonography of your x rays of your limbs that may not have been done if you're suspecting a spine you may get x ray you might get a ct um if they've got neurology you might get an mri with or without contrast and any other blood test for example you've got a, a seat belt injury they are diffusely tender in the abdomen you want to send off an amylase and lipase it will be at this time not at the initial time where you just sent off the cbc and your cross match and coagulation right once you've done your secondary survey extremely stable patient i just wanted to cover the c spine over here it's called the nexus c spine which is the commonest one you've also got the canadian c spine rule uh, basically what these are they are called clinical decision rules what it means is you've got an established um, a rule or an established way of assessing someone and you can decide how to manage them so for this c spine rule the first box is any any risk factors so if you if your patient in front of you is over 65 they are at high risk of x ray uh, of spinal injury so you'll just get radiography you'll either get an x ray or ct but if they're less than 65 they haven't had a dangerous mechanism what's a dangerous mechanism um ejection out of a car a fellow passenger of the car is dead on the scene you fall in three four stories Uh, of of flights of stairs those are all dangerous mechanisms if you've got any kind of uh, numbness any paresthesia these are all high risk factors so if you have any of these they directly get an image they either get x rays or they get a ct if you don't have any of this then you look for any low risk factors so if they have any of this like they were just sitting down or they were in a stationary vehicle and it was hit from behind or they had the accident yesterday and they've come to you today then it's less likely that they've got any serious uh, cervical spine injury so if they've got these they don't have any of these you ask them to rotate their neck so while they are lying in front of you or they are sitting ask them to rotate their neck more than 45 degrees to both sides if they can do that without pain no x rays no ct you can say your neck's not broken there is no fractures you don't need x rays and you can discharge them this is the nexus c spine it's very similar to the canadian c spine next thing trauma team what's a trauma team look something like that you've got a bunch of people standing around the patient who's maybe intubated maybe has got various splints on where has this come from or what is the difference so, so far what i've described to you is the atls concepts a b c d e no doubt that that is a priority in which a person can die that is why it's that but also it was designed if there's only one doctor or one person looking after the patient we don't have that in most of our emergency departments or in our hospitals we have a team so they would attack a b c d e together you've got an anesthetist who look after the airway you've got an emergency physician who's going to do your primary survey you've got an orthopedic surgeon who's assessing the femur the pelvis and you've got two or three nurses one is taking blood samples one is putting o negative blood up so this entire setup is called a trauma team 
where did it come from? You can equate it to a Formula One pit stop. Um, I don't know how many of you follow that. I don't follow it much, but I, I like this example. It's, it's in a matter of a few seconds, this Formula One car, the tires are changed, the fuel is topped up, the driver is given some refreshment, all the mechanisms are checked, and they are off onto the race again. So it's all happening together. The, the entire team is working together synchronously to make that happen in the pit stop. That's what we need to do for a patient, a polytrauma patient. This uh, thing on the right, you can see various team members at various positions. So it's important that you know where you're standing, what you're going to be doing. Um, your roles have to be very clear. And you know which nurse is going to do what, which doctor is going to do what, you're going to have a radiographer part of your team. You need a radiologist part of your team so that you have these protocols in place that this is how we are going to manage a polytrauma. These are the investigations we're going to do. This is the sequence of events that is going to happen. Putting all that together, like the pit stop is a trauma team. That is going to get us the best outcomes. So now the most critical part in in a way is shock management so we discussed earlier that losing blood is hypovolemic shock and trauma there are grades of shock defined and again now i've gone for lawn tennis so the picture on your right um, it shows you if you follow any um, lawn sorry lawn tennis then once you lose the first point, you're 15 love down. You lose your second point, is 30 love. Third point, 40 love. And last point, game over. Grades of shock is in the same way. 15% grade 1. 30% or 15 to 30, grade 2. 30 to 40, grade 3. And more than 40, game over, grade 4. I really want to point out two things on this table. First, grade 1, all you get is an increased heart rate. There is no change in blood pressure. There is no change in respiration. So just tachycardia, which is why you must have heard many people say they're tachycardic, they're tachycardic. Because that's you're, you're, you might be in grade one. You need to treat this. We react or some of us react when the blood pressure falls. Look where it is. Fall in systolic blood pressure. Grade three, 30 to 40%. You've lost 1.5 to 2 liters already. Yeah. So it's important to remember these two things. Always look for tachycardia in a trauma patient and treat it. Your trauma patient with hypotension, time's running out. How do we manage it? What, what uh, bleeding or what hypovolemia does is was known as triad of death. It was hypothermia, sorry, hypovolemia, hypothermia, acidosis, which led to coagulopathy. This has now changed. Uh, to this new terminology, acute traumatic coagulopathy. What it means is, it's not just the triad, it is just a separate entity. Various studies have shown that just by having a trauma, you have a coagulopathy. What it is, is you lose blood, it causes tissue hy hy hypoperfusion, hypothermia, which would cause coagulopathy, which would lead to acidosis, which would lead to coagulopathy, which will lead to hemorrhage. Because of DIC, you start bleeding again. So this is a vicious cycle and go round and round till you break it. How do you break it? So initially I said, when you start and you're giving blood or fluid, it should be warm. You don't want to cool, cool them any further. Most of us these days are in a controlled environment. What do I mean by that? We are in a department which has air conditioning. We are maintaining our temperatures at 22 to 25. Your patient or you are at 37. So if you give them the normal saline that is lying in your cupboard, it's at 24 degrees. You're actually making them even cooler. So you don't want to give them normal, normal saline. You want to give them warm normal saline. You're giving them blood, that's out of the fridge. So you should have a blood warmer. You should give warm fluids. So you're not causing any more hypothermia. You replace blood with blood, which is known as massive transfusion protocol. So you don't want to give them something that's going to dilute their coagulopathy. You want to give them blood so that they get those factors. Critical, turn off the tap. 
we discussed that you've got a tap open in five places one on the floor four more turn off the tap whether it's putting a binder on whether it's putting the leg in traction whether it's um laparotomy body warmer which is a you know it's like a blanket you get blankets which are connected to a to a machine which blows hot air under the blanket so you can surface temperature you can increase the body temperature and when you're operating there's something called tech thromboelastogram which you would be familiar with so when you're operating you check the uh, thromboelastogram which is basically how how stretchy the clot is and that will tell you which factors to give them this is all coming together nicely in what you call a massive transfusion protocol a senior clinician or whoever is the trauma team leader decides okay this is a major trauma they've lost a lot of blood i'm going to activate the massive transfusion protocol you will going to send off some basic labs which is cbc or coagulation you'll do a cas and you'll activate your mtp what does that mean you've got a pre agreed protocol across the hospital which means anybody from that trauma team can just call the blood bank and say massive transfusion protocol activated you don't have to then talk to a hematologist or tell them please give me one unit or two units give me platelet give me no this is pre agreed what when you activate it you automatically get four units of rbc two units of ffp sent to you that's it you're going to get it you've got your own department you're going to give your tranexamic acid and platelets this is a locally agreed protocol so this this is just one example you, we need to have our own protocol if the bleeding is controlled you will let them know and say stop the protocol if it is not controlled there will be further blood coming back while you are giving all this you are monitoring these blood tests which will be sending off and this is your aim you are trying to keep their body temperature over 35 you are trying to keep their acidosis away which is a ph of more than 7.2 your base excess your lactate this is what you monitor when you've got a hypotensive patient with polytrauma this is what you're working on that was about shock management and like i said most critical component this directly ties into damage control again a term a, a word you must have heard uh, more recently um, this picture on the top this is what we used to do when atls started this is what we used to do resuscitation two wide bore iv cannulas giving them 2 liters of normal saline in a protocolized fashion was protocolized resuscitation as per atls then they would go and have a surgery then they would go to critical care to try and recuperate this has changed to damage control resuscitation which integrates with damage control surgery so it's all together your the green bit is resuscitation so resuscitating resuscitating them together while you're doing the surgery now what do you mean by damage control surgery or damage control orthopedics so there are two concepts damage control orthopedics and early total care early total care is self explanatory you would actually do the total care whatever that needs but if you've got a hypotensive a shock patient who is turning acidotic who is turning cold who is you know really sick you are going to do a damage control surgery the first step is starting an emergency we've already discussed you will give blood soon before the crystalloids you will start the protocol of the transfusion um there is something about permissive hypotension i'll come back to that intraoperative you'll move this patient to theater because you have to close the tap it could be the picture on your right which is your external fixator for your pelvis because you put the bland, the binder you you've not been your patient remains unstable you put an x fix on you've got a limb injury you think they're bleeding over there you'll put an x fix on you've got a limb injury with a an arterial injury you may tie the artery off you're not going to sit and uh, uh what's that called reanastomose the artery that's going to take a long time your aim is to control hemorrhage in less than an hour how do you do that you do it by externally fixating it getting the alignment so whichever bone is broken getting them aligned you may have to ligate or amputate a limb to control the bleeding because it's life threatening you lose the limb but you save the you save the patient that is the difference between damage control and total care one 
once you've done that, the basic damage control, you get the patient to critical care. Why? Because you want to rewarm them. They're getting cold. You want to correct their acidosis. You want to correct their coagulopathy. All this is happening in critical care. Does it mean it's not happening when you're operating? So your anesthetists have to be doing this while you're operating. Then they go to ICU, have that. While they're in ICU, they keep looking if there's any ongoing bleeding or if they're worried about compartment syndrome, this patient needs to come back to theater sooner. If not, once they've corrected all this, once they've got your base deficit down, they've got your lactate done, you would take them back to theater and do your definitive surgery. Then you've got your time. You've got a patient who's in a much more stable condition and you can they can tolerate an operative time of one hour, two hours, three hours. They will allow you to get a full surgery. And these three components is what you call damage control orthopedics. Um, on to the last bit. So I've just put on a couple of discussion points. Um, and between uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Siddharth and Agni, whoever wants to put any more questions forward, uh, I've just put these three points. X-rays in primary survey. So we only do two x-rays in a hypotensive trauma patient bedside only two x-rays i've already shown you them chest pelvis you're only looking for blood in your chest or your pelvis that's why you're doing those x-rays you don't x-ray the femur you don't x-ray the humerus yes in a stable patient your primary survey is done you're happy you're not transfusing them blood you're not rushing them to theater you get all the other x-rays otherwise you do only two x-rays we used to do lateral c spine we don't need to do that anymore. Next discussion, springing of the pelvis. Um, something that we did where we would push down on uh, both the anterior superior iliac spine and check if there's a springing. We don't do that anymore again because we've got departments with portable x-ray machines. You can get a pelvis x-ray immediately. We are not looking for a severe pubic rami fracture. We're not looking for a minor injury. We are looking for a complete disruption. We're looking for a cause for hypovolemic shock, which your plain pelvis x-ray will tell you. It will tell you to put the binder on. I would go one step further. If your mechanism of injury or your clinical examination puts a doubt that they're bleeding in the pelvis, you just put the binder on. You don't need to spring it. You don't need to get an x-ray. You just put the binder on because you're, you know what the treatment is. The treatment is to close the volume. Um, third thing, permissive hypotension. Um, this is a concept which is uh, where you're allowing, like the name suggests, you're allowing hypotension. Why? Because, the, sorry, this is only in scenarios of blunt trauma. This is not for penetrating trauma and definitely contraindicated in head trauma. This is only for blunt trauma, particularly abdominal blunt trauma, pelvic blunt trauma. Why? because your body is trying to form a clot. If you put the blood pressure too high, they are saying you could blow off that clot. You, in, in, a, in uh, trying to get the blood pressure up, you're diluting the plasma. So those are all the reasons why you allow for permissive hypotension. This is a concept which you apply when you are about to take the patient to the operation theater. This again is not something that you can do while you're transporting a patient from one hospital to another. This is just to buy enough time to get them into the operation theater. You allow for a bit of hypotension because hypotension is a bad thing. It is grade three shock. You cannot just allow that to happen. You allow it for half an hour while you're getting the patient ready to get into theater. So those were my three points. Um, so what we did is we talked about primary survey, which was treating the biggest threat to life. Uh, irrespective of the diagnosis, irrespective of the specific injuries, irrespective of the history. If they're stable, we will go on to secondary survey. This is a head-to-toe head -to detailed examination uh, where you don't want to miss anything. We talked about the trauma team, how critical that is, that you've got a team which is working together. The roles are defined so that when you get that patient into your hospital, this team just pounces on them like the pit stop and all the things are happening synchronously and that is what's going to save lives. Shock management, break the cycle. Hypo hypovolemia, hypotension, 
hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy, that vicious cycle has to be broken. How do we broke it? Massive transfusion protocol, keep the patient warm, give them warm stuff. Most importantly, close the tap. And then the concept of damage control also. Thank you. Any questions?